Hello and welcome to episode one of our mini series, The Driving Force, where we're exploring what really is driving the sustainability agenda in industry. This podcast is brought to you by Tribasonics. We are a transformational hard tech technology business using unique sensing technologies to create value and drive sustainability for its global industrial customers. And we are your hosts, Christina King, Chief Commercial Officer, and Mark Wallace, Chief Operating Officer. We are delighted to welcome Warwick Matthews. Warwick is the Managing Director and Chief Commercial Officer at Tokamak Energy. Warwick joined Tokamak Energy in January 2023. He leads the business and is building the partnership strategy to scale Tokamak Energy. Fusion is the energy that powers the sun and the stars. Uh, Tokamak Energy is building upon 10 years of experience and will bring fusion to the grid in the early 2030s. Warwick previously worked at Rolls-Royce for 23 years and managed a £3.6 billion annual spend as a Chief Procurement Officer for the Civil Aerospace Division. He has extensive experience in managing supply chains and strategic relationships. Since 2010, Warwick held leadership positions in operations. He led a team of over 2,000 in the control systems business unit, transformed Rolls-Royce's global engine overhaul network and ran the engine production and test facilities in Derby. Prior to this, Warwick's initial career was on the customer side of the business in commercial, sales and leadership roles, managing Rolls-Royce's business with global airlines and leasing companies, which included three years based in North America. Warwick is passionate about people and diversity and inclusion and Warwick has been a director of Sinfonia Viva Orchestra since 2015. Warwick's married with two amazing daughters. Welcome, Warwick. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I suppose we should start with the really big question. What is fusion? <laughs> should we start there? And then you could tell us a little bit about what Tokamak Energy does. Uh, yeah, sure. So as Mark highlighted, fusion is the the power source of the sun, powers the sun and all of the stars. And so our renewable technology like solar essentially is coming from fusion. In the sun, you have very light hydrogen atoms, nuclei that are under conditions that allow them to fuse. And by fusing, they create helium and they create a huge amount of energy. And it's the energy that we feel. So we are recreating the power of the sun and the stars here on Earth. And we're doing that within what's called a tokamak reactor. And that is effectively using very high field magnets to contain plasma in a magnetic bottle uh, and recreate that reaction. Now, to do that here on Earth, you actually need to increase the temperature level because you don't have that huge ball of energy that is the sun with its mass and the fields that it experiences. So to do it within a reactor, you need to up the temperature level to about six and a half times the temperature of the sun. That is an incredible 100 million degrees Celsius and use uh, very high field magnets to create the densities to allow that fusion reaction to happen. The great thing about fusion is the fuel for it is universally abundant. Effectively, it comes from seawater. And it's why fusion is deemed to be the holy grail for energy production, because it can do what no other source of energy can do. It can provide power where you need it, uh, and it's secure because it's coming from essentially a globally abundant fuel. Did you say that the, f- the fuel is available in seawater? I did, yeah. So to power a fusion reaction, you, you need two isotopes of hydrogen for a commercial reactor. They're deuterium and tritium. And deuterium, you'll find uh, one in every 3,000 or so molecules of hydrogen in seawater is deuterium. Uh, And so there's your fuel source. Just to put it in context as well, I'm holding a water bottle, which most people do when they uh, come to work. That water bottle, let's say one kilogram of fusion fuel is equivalent to 10 million kilograms of coal or oil or fossil fuels. It is incredible 
incredibly efficient. Wow. Um, the other thing that you need for this is naturally occurring lithium salt. So not enriched lithium salt. And again, globally abundant fuel. And that's the huge opportunity that this technology presents. So I'm really curious to know how you actually get the temperature started on one of these reactions, because <laughs> that's quite, quite a high temperature you need. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So um, you need a bit of power to start that reaction. But then the, the, the secret is in the device itself. So a, a spherical tokamak, which is what we use. Um, let's go into that in a little detail. A traditional or conventional tokamak is a torus. It's a donut shaped reactor. Uh, our visionaries who were, uh, they themselves spun out of the Cullum campus very nearby where I'm working now, uh, about 10 years ago, saw an opportunity to make the reactor more efficient by making it spherical, uh, more of a cord apple shape. And that allows the reactor to be more efficient. You need far less power to self-drive the plasma at that temperature. And uh, it, it also allows, therefore, the, the lowest uh, cost of capex and operating cost for that. The only downside is at the point that they spun that out, you needed a, a step change in magnet technology, what, what are called HTS magnets, high temperature superconducting magnets that didn't really exist at the time. But our technology roadmap has seen us become world leader in this technology, and that's the real key to uh, a spherical tokamak is the, the design itself and the HTS magnets that allow you to sustain plasma at these temperatures. And, and we are really proud to say this isn't some sci-fi somewhere over, over the rainbow temperature. We, we achieved this just over a year ago here where we're located in Milton Park, just south of Abingdon, Oxfordshire. Uh, we have our reactor ST40. And a year ago that achieved a 100 million degree plasma iron temperature, and also what's called uh, the highest triple product of any private device. Triple product is a mixture of temperature, um, confinement time, density of the plasma, and it's the equivalent of fusion power. It's the proxy for fusion power. Um, we achieved the highest result, and we did it in a tokamak 15 times smaller than anything that had done this previously. Um, so, yeah, we've done some great things looking in the rearview mirror. Now, where I come in and why I've joined is looking at the road ahead. And we have a technology roadmap that increases the scale of our devices, incorporates the HTS magnet technology and sets out a path to commercial fusion applications. So could you tell us a little bit about this roadmap? We, we understand Tokamak will be bringing energy to the grid in early 20, 2030s, but you'll be fully aware that there is a running joke in, in industry that fusion is always 10 years away. So mm. t tell us a little bit about the, the steps that you will be making over the next 10 years to actually achieve that. Mark, you're very generous already because the running joke is usually that it's 30 years <laughs> away, always will be, but you know, things have changed. What, what has changed? Um, breakthroughs in the hard technology like HTS magnets. So just to explain those, um, a superconducting magnet is effectively one that at a given temperature has zero resistance. So it can carry huge amounts of power and you, in a magnet you can create very, very high field strength. Our magnets, the field strength is one million times Earth's magnetic field. And so if you try and convert that into pressure in something that makes sense for my brain, it's, it's kind of equivalent to if you were in that, uh, in the center of that magnetic field, the pressure would be equivalent to being two times the deepest ocean on earth. So two times the pressure at the bottom of the Mariana trench. So you have these advancements in magnet technology that the HTS bit means that they can operate at a higher temperature than their predecessor called LTS, low temperature superconductors. LTS have to be at a temperature of four Kelvin, which is extremely cold, almost ab absolute zero. HTS often raises a smile because they're at 20 to 30 Kelvin, already very, very cold as well. 
But the difference is you can achieve that temperature with a three pin plug with a cryostat or a cryo cooler. For LTS, you need liquid helium, which raises the complexity and cost of those magnets. So big breakthrough in the hard technology, design of a tokamak. Then the other big breakthrough is what, what has been done with software, uh, machine learning, in a reactor setup, a plasma is a difficult thing to control. A burning plasma, you can imagine, wants to do its own thing. And you control it with magnetic fields. We'll be making adjustments to that magnetic field maybe 30,000 times per second to control a burning plasma. Um, and for that, you need to have very, very sophisticated digital twin technology to model that behavior. But also in an operating context, very sophisticated operating software. So there's been big breakthroughs there, and we're doing work um, with partners on artificial intelligence and machine learning and how that's applied to it. So the enabling technology is coming together. We have some other technology we need to deliver in our technology roadmap, things like liquid metal shielding within the reactor itself. But we've broken down the technology challenges into 11 building blocks and have a technology readiness level program associated with all of those. In the roadmap that you asked about that lies ahead, we have an intermediate device which will prove out these technologies, things like liquid metal, things like long pulse, high performance plasmas um, that give us the confidence that we can go to the next step, which is a uh, prototype reactor, which would be a net energy reactor, uh, 200 megawatts reactor in the early 2030s. So we we scale up and incorporate the new technology as it matures. Others are backing the similar level of confidence. If you look at the US, then the US Department of Energy itself has issued a decade or challenge, a 10 year challenge to deliver a, a fusion pilot plant it believes that it can be done and when you have countries like the us and like the uk through uk aea getting behind the mission working with private companies you build much more confidence that this is doable and it will happen and fusion needs to happen uh, for us to achieve net zero in all of these countries by 2050. i've got to ask you warwick how how safe is these fusion reactors. I'm quite fascinated with kind of your burning plasma and all this energy yeah. that's kind of created. You know, how, how safe it, it is, is it? A, it's a fantastic question. And, and I think generally, you know, the, the level of knowledge around fusion is increasing, but we've got a long way to go um, because it's brand new, right? So people often ask, how safe is it in the context of the reaction that's taking place? And sometimes in the context of 100 million degree, anything sounds <laughs> dangerous, right? But so the first thing, fusion by design has got its own fail safe, I would say. If you compare it to nuclear fission, where you are splitting a very heavy atom, there is always a potential that that can have a runaway condition. And that's what modern reactors control and they're, they're safe. Um, but it does influence the level of regulation that's around that, which then influences where you can do it and how much it costs. Um, fusion is different because rather than splitting an atom, you are forcing two very light nuclei to fuse. And they desperately, desperately don't want to do that, <laughs> which is why you have to have very, very high fields and extremely high temperatures. And the moment that one of these conditions falls away, the reaction stops. You also have at any one point in time, the efficiency of that fuel that I mentioned, tiny amounts of fuel driving that reaction, one or two grams of fuel at any point in time. So the reaction wants to stop. Um, and then the, the, uh, the reactor itself has very sophisticated materials uh, that, that hold the plasma in position in this magnetic bottle. Um, it will occasionally touch um, an area called the diverter. Uh, and again, you may lose a small amount of material, but it stops quickly. There is no risk with the temperature. Um, so it is a very, very safe process by design. And um, 
and we we need to talk more about it and do more events like like this um to to make people aware and certainly when we're out talking with other companies and actual nations about their net zero plans now the great thing about fusion is because it is inherently safe because it is compact in terms of the reactor size itself you can put this in a densely populated area you can put this in a industrial park to power a heavy industry application it doesn't have to be a long way away from where you need the power which again cuts down on very expensive transmission costs Mm -hmm. of getting the power where you need it so in in terms of form factor or size of these plants um, and and indeed safety as as you and christine have been exploring it sounds to me that that this technology may well overtake the current drive in the industry towards the small modular reactors which of course is is fission rather than fusion do, do, you, do you see the two technologies small modular reaction and 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 your your tokamak technology do you see them competing yeah i think i think when you look across all net zero um, or zero emissions energy sources there is a big portfolio there and there is space for all of them in my view Um, fission is available now um, packaging that into a smaller modular reactor with technology that's there now is good we we should we should do that at a later date there is the potential to upgrade reactors with fusion but you would probably start with upgrading coal-fired power plants before you go anywhere near SMRs. So the demand is so great for power globally. Within the next 10 years or so, we have one and a half billion more people on the planet. They are demanding ever higher standards of living, which means that they consume more power. So in that time, you have a 100% increase in electricity demand. And we have to answer that with a portfolio of of solutions. Renewables play a huge part in that. And the cost of solar and the cost of wind is ever decreasing, which is fantastic. But they have their drawbacks. You know, the, the intermittency of not having solar at night, to state the obvious, or not having wind power when the wind doesn't blow, means that you need to couple that with energy storage solutions, which are complex and expensive and you also have to have a huge amount of land and that usually means it's a long way away from where you need the power so you have transmission costs so it's where the portfolio fits together and fusion is the one that can provide secure power because energy security is more and more and more important whether that's from a war in russia teaching us this lesson or other nations who can up, uh, raise or lower their output of oil and it have a dramatic effect on another country. So security of energy, availability of fuel, having that in country where you need it and having dispatchable base load power, meaning you turn it on, it's on um, when you need it is, is where fusion fits into this portfolio. It can do what none of the others can do, um, which is why it's such a great opportunity for the future from an emissions point of view, but also from a business point of view. You know, it's a huge market of the future, a $9 trillion market by 2050. We deliver this technology to our plans. Mm. I wanted to also ask you um, about obviously talking about the the benefits of of fusion one of the other kind of drawbacks of some of the renewables is that is the whole life cycle cost of you know some of the turbines you hear of like blade kind of graveyards and and things like that so i'm quite interested to know what what is the impact yeah. of kind of your your kind of sector and is there any kind of life cycle cost there uh, yeah the, the easiest way to answer it is any any energy that you're putting forward the currency is the levelized cost of energy Um, and we have to aim for a cost effective price point so our levelized cost of energy needs to be um, around 70 or below 70 per megawatt hour uh, in the the first generation of reactors 
Um, and then we need that to, with an experience curve, drop down to around 50 uh, in the second generation. And these are our plans. Uh, and that measure brings in how much does it cost to buy this thing? How much does it cost to operate it? How much does it cost to maintain it? Um, so maintenance, there is a maintenance schedule for a fusion reactor. Um, we design on a 50-year uh, lifespan of a reactor, but it all comes together at that levelized cost of energy. So you see a future where there is a portfolio of sustainable energy sources, right? be that solar, wind, uh, or, or, or various nuclear sources. Uh, and the way, you, the, way, the way you were talking is that you, you don't see that as, as competition, um, which is really interesting, you know, it's sort of whatever is the right solution for the particular context, a uh, particular time of day even. Um, do you see competition within your field itself that there are other businesses like you, like your own on the race to, um, you know, to create and get up and running the first plant? Yes, I, uh, I, I think it's a mixture of competition and cooperation so we, we have the co-opetition word um, <laughs> and that's how I describe it at the moment because the fusion industry needs to win and the technology is really hard which is why we're not awash with fusion power plants now um, it's great to say in the last few years alone we've seen five billion or so of uh, private capital going into this sector to complement the government programs that are, are running and the government programs are ambitious as well you can look at you know the uk aea and what it's announced with step here in the uk there's some fantastic and ambitious plans there is a coming together of public and private to get the best out of that system to be able to go fast on the back of a, a private company and there are many private companies now that are driving fusion around the world, and they're taking different approaches as well. So that most of them are using a conventional tokamak or uh, some uh, magnetic confinement of plasma. Uh, that is the one with the, the most pedigree, history, experience, knowledge in both government and private programs. But there are new novel approaches being developed as well each of those having different advantages and different technological challenges to make them repeatable. Um, my belief is that you know, it, it, it won't be a one winner takes all market. The market is so large. Uh, and I do think that we will see an industry, some companies solving some of the technology challenges really well, and maybe they come together in final solutions. So right now we, we're competing. Absolutely. But we're very supportive of our peers because we want Fusion Inc. to be successful and win as fast as it possibly can win. You only started in January. You speak as if, from a technical perspective and the, the, your understanding of the technology, you speak as if you've been there for years. It must be, uh, it must have been quite a journey so far. Yeah, I think, um, and I love doing what I was doing before, right? And I've been at Rolls Royce for a long time. And it always challenged me with different experiences and jobs, and I, and I really enjoyed it. But I've, I've been watching this industry for probably the last five years, been watching this company for about the last five years. Uh, and I knew if I was going to go anywhere, this was the place. Um, so I'm very passionate about this subject and how I can help with the team here commercialize fusion. And that we're never, ever going to do this alone um, so the key is the partnerships that we develop uh, with countries themselves but very strong and capable industrial supply chain partners future customers of, of this uh, fusion power who can help get us there sooner uh, and help can help develop technology and when the technology is ready roll this out as fast as we possibly can at global scale. And, and that's a hugely exciting brief for somebody like me uh, to come in and be able to develop a business and commercialize it in that way. Um, so, so yeah, it's a fantastic industry and a job that 
every Friday night when I finish my working week, I'm thinking, what a great week, you know, and I can't <laughs> wait until I'm uh, back into the next one. So, all, uh, yeah, speaks, it's, it's great. It speaks so well of your background, you know, this idea of partnering with the right suppliers to get you to where you need to be. Uh, your background, of course, in, in supply chain and procurement um, really, really leads into that very well. Yeah, I think essentially, you know, businesses do business with each other, but people are on both sides of that and um, effective business relationships are formed around effective personal relationships as well. And whether it's on the the customer side of, of the house within my Rolls-Royce career or, or the supply chain running procurement, I've always enjoyed developing strong partnerships with leaders in those organizations. And that that's exactly what we're doing here now as well with some very, very strong um, global uh, partners. And can you tell us a little bit about some of your partners who you're working with? I mean, you don't have to say names, but just kind of what, what types of businesses or um, countries that are really kind of yeah. engaging with this process? Because you're, you're changing the world effectively. And, you know, that's a quite ambitious project. And it's really just quite exciting to hear how you're doing it, what kind of partners are engaged and how they're kind of yeah. going on that journey with you. Uh, well, I think you'd start with how important the role of governments are in this. Um, and I take the UK as a, as a great example. Yeah, if we're honest, the UK has lost a lot of industry that it was once proud of. Um, here is an opportunity for it to take an absolutely leading position and it is doing that now. You know, we, we have uh, incredible capability through the UK AEA uh, here at the Cullum site where they've operated JET, the joint European tourist for decades. And they've got a huge power base in infusion. Um, and they're working with private companies uh, like ours to accelerate everybody. I would I would equally look at the US Department of Energy. I referenced earlier that they've laid down a 10-year challenge for a fusion prototype and i think other countries are looking at their net zero commitments for 2050 and thinking we've got gaps and fusion really does come in to solve some of those gaps in the hardest to abate industries that they have in in country so country level governments hugely important um, then you're looking at partners who can help you develop some novel technology things like um, advanced alloys that um, can be neutron resistant within a difficult operating environment. So there'd be one example. Um, and maybe others who are currently rolling out big infrastructure programs, whether that's um, you know, other power stations or within oil and gas or petrochemical the, these are the kind of organizations that have the scale to be able to really roll out at pace and i mentioned earlier sometimes there you have companies that tick all these boxes you know they are a there is a supply chain partner but they're also a future major consumer of fusion because although we we often think about fusion as electricity to the grid it's even more efficient if you can directly use the industrial heat that comes from the reactor. Then you don't have to push it through a turbine where you have parasitic losses of the, the power. So you may start with 1.4 gigawatt of thermal energy to get 500 megawatts of electric power. If you can use the thermal energy in a process to produce aluminium or cement or fertilizer, if you can use a combination of thermal and electricity in a petrochemicals plant, then you can decarbonize these really difficult um, industries, as well as the production of hydrogen, the production of ammonia, which can then decarbonize things like shipping fleets around the world. So, so yes, the big partners are on the customer side and on the supply chain side and on the, the governmental level. Just going back to one of your comments there about the use of heat for industrial processes, could could you envisage a, a reactor being installed on a large industrial plant pu purely for that purpose, uh, and and for no electricity to leave that site, but for the heat to be used for for some process? 
yes absolutely yes yeah so um and many of these processes whether it's um hydrogen i mentioned production you know, they can take that industrial heat and that that's actually what what they need in their manufacturing equally with petrochemicals other industries that are you know are the head scratchers of how do we decarbonize them when they have such a hunger for for power and and heat and um, fusion fits in really well into that ecosystem i think i really think that's fascinating some of the companies that we go and visit in europe are actually kind of replacing their old power stations that are on their site with new efficient energy and i can see absolutely this is this is another kind of application for that because they can really kind of look to make their whole processes more efficient so i think yes. you know there's loads of kind of market opportunities for this for like you say industrial customers you could see it kind of having one at a port for example where the where the marine vessels kind of charge up when they kind of come in oh it's i mean it's just global and yeah I've, i'm finding and this, producing yeah. hydrogen yeah producing hydrogen at, at ports and then you know, you're not using fusion as a direct propulsion of a ship but you are using it to produce hydrogen where they need it which mm. is you know when they're going into a major major port in dubai or in singapore yeah and do you think your business will will scale into all those markets or will you kind of get partners that where you kind of give them, not give them the technology, but they, they then enable it in those particular sectors? How, how do you see the growth of this happening? Mm. Well, yeah, that's a great question. So there is a lot of scope for a, effectively a licensing model um, and to bring those partners on board, whether they're big, big parts of the supply chain or, um, or big consumers and give them access to the technology either within an area such as you know aluminium production for example um, <clears throat> or within a geographical territory uh, and, and all of those uh, concepts are under discussion with uh, potential investors and partners in in tokamak energy yeah mm. well we're all kind of uh, having um recruitment kind of growth at the minute so i um, would be really fascinated to know you know what kind of team can make this happen in terms of the people the skills the expertise and you know what and even the kind of culture and and diversity quite interested in in learning how, how are you building that at your business so um yeah we have some phenomenal talent in this organization i'm very uh, very pleased to say i'm probably the least qualified person I know. But, uh, you're a good conductor, that's bit... Warwick. That's that's how you do it. If you're a good conductor, you can make it happen. There you are. Thank you for that. And um, But but I do mean it seriously. I think we have 60 plus PhDs, uh, 75 MSc qualified people. We're only a company of 250 people. So the skill base is incredible. Um and if I'm looking to talk to an investor about Tokamak Energy, you know, there's a lot of PowerPoint in the world. There's a, there's a lot of fusion PowerPoint and we have fusion power here. People can come see our site. They can see, yes, we have a operational working fusion reactor here. It's done incredible things. But what really blows them away is when they talk to our people, the energy that they have, on this subject, you know, it, we have people here who are driven by more than coming to work for a paycheck. They believe in the mission of what they are doing and the change that that can make happen. So they're full of energy, buzzing, really smart, uh, and it, it's just great to have. Um, as an industry, we need to cultivate more people that look like this in, in the future. And so we have launched our STEM outreach program here. We've got um, ever-growing number of STEM ambassadors. And I think it's important for the fusion industry to educate, get out there, excite. But we need to be doing that at school level and even at primary school level, because these are the people who will be delivering fusion in the future operating these devices leading companies like this in the future and we've got to get in at that early level so we can influence a really diverse mix 
to to join this industry uh, in the future. Yeah, absolutely agree. I've I must admit it's the the most kind of <laughs> energy I've felt, and and really where there's no kind of division between girls, boys is is at primary school level they're all very interested yeah. if you've got a you know a good story to tell and you can kind of excite them about this sector and sometimes it's just kind of exposure to those kind of sectors a lot of people don't know what's out there so really really pleased to to hear that i'm a stem ambassador and i think mm. mark is as well so we're we're fully on board with that type of activity so that's fantastic very good. Well, my um, my biggest cheerleaders are my two girls. So, uh, as mentioned, <laughs> yeah. I have two daughters, and they're ten and twelve. And um, and I would also add that when we decided I was going to come do this job, it was kind of a family decision uh, taken last summer. And um, they were bought in as well. They have huge belief in what this technology can do. And um, yeah, they're both mad on the environment. And um, uh, yeah, they really want to work in this industry in the future. So we've got to grow it for many people uh, to join. And my girls are two of them. So I've, I've got a question for you. Um, you know, this, it all sounds amazing. And it's, this is the future kind of what, what keeps you up at night at the, at the end of the week? I know you said it was, uh, you have really exciting weeks. And there's, I, I can imagine it's a bit of a roller coaster ride. Uh, but yeah. what are kind of the day to day challenges that you have uh so what keeps me up up at night we, we've got fantastic technology we've got great roadmap ahead the fuel that fusion needs is money and so a huge part of all private companies in this sector who are currently non-revenue their r d companies is finding the partnerships and the funding to maintain the trajectory that we need to deliver this uh, and that's where you're you're always talking with potential investors um, at all levels to secure that for the future. And it's the lifeblood of what we do. Um, and sometimes I see where money is getting spent in the world and wish more of it could be applied to this industry. But, you know, that's the job of being a leader in this organization and this industry as well is to secure that funding, because with it, we will make fusion happen much faster um, than if we are slowing down our own uh, growth trajectory just on the ability to fund the business. Um, so that that's the challenge we all have. And it's where we need to get the funding to maintain our pace. Between Tribesonics and Tokamak, we clearly share uh, a core theme of innovation because both, both businesses are... Yes. You know, we're solving impossible problems and you can't do that without innovating around a, around a challenge and innovation doesn't just happen you know you put steps and processes in place to ensure that a business can be innovative and the staff are able to innovate effectively how do you achieve that at, at tokamak um a lot of it is in the in the culture so the the benefit of a private company is that we can take risk so you have to say risk is a good thing yeah, you know, we um, we're not here to be conservative in what we are developing. So you have to let everybody know that, and that uh, you know, back to a fail fast mindset is to try new things. You know, if they fail, learn from them, adjust quickly. But it, it, engendering that innovative spirit, um, and then you know, two weeks ago we um. We put a challenge out there. We, we've, we're all doing our thing in our day job, but we wanted a, a big ideas challenge out to all employees to say, what else have you got? You know, what, what do you think about that could be just a, a, a crazy concept, crazy idea? So we're working through the 49 <laughs> ideas that Brilliant. came through for that now. <laughs> um, and we, we've shortlisted our, uh, our top ideas but there's some fantastic things in there, just so much creativity. And I've said to the team, you know, give me the ideas, give us the ideas and challenge us to find the way to fund those ideas. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it's tapping into people and making them feel free to, to suggest anything and everything. And if it's not good, adjust and move on. But, you know, I know that within the 49 ideas there, there are, gems and um, it's how we really accelerate those ideas 
Can you give us a, a flavor of one of the most exciting innovations that you, you see coming through? Wow. <laughs> well, pretty much everything <laughs> that we're doing because you have to in- innovate to mature this technology. And I've said about how it, it what we're doing was impossible 15 years ago. It's impossible, some of it, 10 years ago. And that that's amazing that we are knocking over impossibility roadblocks. Um, so what's the most exciting? I think maybe how you control a burning plasma in a reactor with magnet technology, just generally. Uh, and the the software that you need and the control system that you need to make that happen. I, I mentioned earlier, you are you are telling the magnets to adjust their field about thirty thousand times per second to to hold a burning plasma. It's um yeah, it, it feels science fiction, but we do it. You know, it's uh, it's incredible. So thank you, Warwick, for for joining our podcast today. I think, you know, you're a fantastic ambassador for Tokamak Energy. I think this podcast will help get the message out there and hopefully get some more investment for you. And we're really excited to be coming down to visit you soon to really see it all in action. Uh, So thank you very much, Warwick. We really appreciate you being here today. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about... um about fusion our technology and and our people and um, we look forward to welcoming you down here on site so you can you can see what we do and uh, see st40 our a reactor and meet some of those people i've talked about who are developing this incredible technology thank you Warwick. we've got a number of physicists and data scientists who are ready to book a minibus down to come and yeah. see you uh, it's been <laughs> such an exciting conversation uh, really grateful for your time and we look forward to uh, to talking further. Mm-hmm.